Um, we are here with uh, Gilbert Hernandez. I'm Jim Rugg, and um, thank you for coming out. Uh, so we're both comic book artists, and I think we're going to talk today a little bit about uh, our experiences making comics. Um, and, and, but first, I'd like to introduce Gilbert uh, properly. So in 1982, Fantagraphics starts publishing Love and Rockets, and it's kind of a, from my point of view, a revolutionary moment in comics history and certainly has had a profound impact on, on my life and my career. Um, one of the things that I find very interesting about your career is that you, you leave Love and Rockets, well, you don't leave Love and Rockets, but you expand to explore things like graphic novels and you know, continue to be uh, as relevant as ever, almost reinventing yourself uh, several times over the last couple of decades. And so uh, it's an honor to be on stage with you today. And you. we will have um, time for questions at the end. Um, I don't know, are you open to questions as we go along? Sure, if something yeah, anything, comes up? whatever, it feels good for everybody. You know, I've just been doing this for 35 years. <laughs> <laughs> I could use a change. Nah, uh, yeah, whatever's good. Whatever, you know, just as long as people get to find out what they want to know. All right, sounds good. So um, one of the things that I wanted to start with, as a self-taught cartoonist, I, I find a lot of information just from asking everybody what they do and how they do it. And you've been making comics since the early 80s, so I'm curious what your routine is like as a, as a working full-time artist. Well, I started out like most people where I was just lazy most of the time, <laughs> avoiding it most of the time, and taking a six-page story like six months to do, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, I started out that way, and but it, when it when it when we got picked up by uh, by Fantagraphics, uh, for some reason, uh, our publisher Gary Groth, you know, we we, pub we self published our own 32 page comic. And we could barely get through that, right? It's 1981, and uh, Gary Groth said, "Yeah, we'd like to publish your comic." And we, yeah, okay, great. This is you know the timing is great, and but he goes, "But we want it to be 64 pages." Now we're completely untrained and un. You know, it just we couldn't fathom doing that, so it took. It felt it took a year. They say it wasn't a year, but it felt like it took a year just to do that thing. And I asked Gary Groth to this day, "Why did you want us to do 64-page comic?" He goes, oh, "I thought it'd be better, <laughs> longer." Well, Gary, uh, he just wanted to uh, disassociate from the mainstream at the time. There was a good reason for that, because the mainstream comics uh, by then were just you know floundering, going spinning their wheels, uh, treating their uh, artists and writers uh, worse than they ever had because comics were just going nowhere and uh, there's a few artists that wanted to break through but it was difficult so we just decided uh, since we're uh, Jaime and I were in the punk scene uh, it was it, we, we just we had the who, who we don't give a shit attitude you know just like well we know how to make comics we've been making for ourselves for a while and uh, Jaime was smart enough uh, to just go into what he was into at the time going to punk shows and so he created the Maggie and Hopi world. And I was just doing science fiction goofball stuff, and I was sort of still doing that because I was laying around, and I go, I should finish this and put, put this in the book. So anyway, and then, and then eventually, you know, the, the response was good, and that's when I dared myself to do the Palomar stories, which I was certainly happy. But anyway, as far as the process goes, um, it was hard at first to get books out, just because I'd ne we'd never thought about it. We never had training. We never had... We just drew comics for ourselves, hoping somewhere it would go somewhere, but we didn't know where. You know, because we didn't want to draw Spider-Man or you know, Thor or anything like that. Not, not because we had that much against it. It was just, it was just not who we were. You know, right. It just wasn't. It was already there. We didn't need to. You know. So, so it was just, just through trial and error. You know, and pushing myself uh, as a sort of, sort of, as a duty to get this out. And you know, and, you know. And so I just disciplined myself. To the point now, I used to be the you know two in the morning guy, you know this and I bleary eyed, you know finishing work, doing this and that, uh, avoiding it as usual, you know. Um, I, I used to go through those habits, but then I, I just started hunkering down, thinking, wait, what's what's the enemy here? Not doing the comic or doing the comic? Well, not doing the comic is the enemy. So I, I literally had this 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 epiphany, and then just said, well. If I enjoy it so much, why don't I make that, you know, we'll put an effort into that, and, and, and eventually I'll get used to it. You, you know, it won't, won't be such a chore. Uh, and then, and then uh, you know, I, I started working, you know, a lot more and faster and this and that, and I started doing more books, and then uh, pretty soon I just started, it just became a habit to do, to be, do a lot of comics. It just turned into a habit. Uh, and Hyman never got, got into that habit. He just loves to just do it his way, and then 
take off whatever he wants to. He just prefers it that way. But I, I, I my, my particular OCD is that I got to get this out. I got to do, and I can't just get one comic out. I got to get three out. You know, it just started to build up that way. And now I have a normal uh, schedule because you know when my daughter was born uh, 17 years ago. I had to have a schedule of, you know, uh, waking up with the baby, you know, as well. You know, my wife did too, but, you know, it was, it was just best for me to have a schedule during the day. So I, I stopped doing the two in the morning thing and started, you know, get the baby ready for the day. You know, you feed the baby and, and then my wife takes care of the baby while I'm drawing. And so it was sort of a, a, a you know, I did all that in the daytime. And then, you know, um, I stopped doing the two in the morning thing. And now I, I work, I, I, I work it like a job. It's like I get in the morning and you know, I get ready, and then I, I work it until five o'clock, and then I'm done. But I, I make sure I'm done because I, instead of this spotty stuff of doing it here and then doing it here and doing it, and it's just an all-day process, which I used to do. Uh, anyway, uh, th th I'm making this as long as I possibly can. Um, <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, anyway, so it just uh, I, I, so now uh, for for 17 years I've had a, a, a routine, a schedule of when I draw and when I don't draw as as best I can. I mean, sometimes if you're on a deadline, you're working sure. extra and stuff. Uh, so anyway, that's it. Uh, I've just learned uh, to be a grown-up about it and, and draw it when I'm when, when this is my time to draw. Get to drawing, you know. So so the advice would be having a child is a <laughs> well, good way to get on a regular schedule. That was for me. <laughs> that was for me though. But um, it was always a good idea to have uh, structure. Yeah. I noticed most uh, people just do, uh, especially artists, creative people, don't like having structure. But since well, the, part of it was work uh, getting jobs at uh, DC and couple of times at Marvel. You have to have structure. You have right. to get those suckers out. And they don't give you enough time uh, to, to do the, uh, w what's expected of you. Like, Just okay, you're going to do a monthly comic, and it's going to be six issues. Right. We want you to do take a month to do each comic. I go, that's impossible. It takes two months to do a comic. Uh, they don't care. <laughs> right. <laughs> you want to get paid? You got to do it. So I, I pushed myself and, and just, you know, because my first and mainstream thing I did with, with Peter Bag was called Yeah. And luckily I didn't have to write it. I just drew it and I didn't have to letter it, color it. I just drew it and inked it. But it was hard because it's like, oh, I'd finish, you know, 22 pages, you know, in, in a month. And I was like, then literally the next day you start the next one. And I wasn't used to that. But since I've been doing it so much, uh, all that horrible uh, work. Uh, <laughs> workload uh, taught me to, you know, apply that to my own work, you know, so it's a volunteer situation of getting my work out. I find there's a momentum as well whenever I'm working, uh, you know, on a longer project or whatever, mm -hmm. I often, you almost get in, in a stride, you know, mm -hmm. it, yeah. it'd be like an athlete being in shape for their season or something, yeah. uh, and, and if I keep that momentum moving, if I have that next story ready to go, as mm -hmm. opposed to taking time off at the end of yeah. a, a book, mm -hmm. um, I can maintain that, Sure. but it's that that inertia of whether I'm working or not working, mm. I tend to keep doing that and it, it's harder to change those gears. In my, in my case, I have to stop. If I don't stop, I'll keep going and I know it'll be burnout and I'll start to do shitty stuff. I know that's gonna happen if I just don't stop. This is actually, coming to this convention is actually me stopping. Because <laughs> I, I was behind, behind on this uh, mainstream comic that I'm working on and uh, I just needed to get away from it because it was like it, once I finished you know, an issue, Next, this, they sent me the script for the next one. Next, you know, I'm, I have two days off and I'm back to doing, you know. But uh, this is great because now I don't, I don't have to draw comics for three days. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I think that's the opposite of the dream. Like, don't we all want to draw comics? It's, uh, no, I do, it's but, funny. Uh, but it's in my head to sure. just, uh, like, I better do extra so I'll get it done faster. And then I got to teach myself to slow down. I do. Um, in my own practice, I do a lot of freelance, and so it becomes multitasking. I tend to have a lot of projects going on all at once. And this has led to me working essentially all the time. Yeah. Uh, whenever I started freelancing from a day job, I kind of panicked falling out of that routine and having a regular paycheck. And so I developed the bad habit of working basically seven days a week for several years and burning, you know, feeling that burnout. Sure. And I started, uh, one year I decided I had to take a day off each week, and it changed everything for me. It, it created a routine, and it created structure, and mm. it sort of, instead of like time being infinite and just knowing my list goes on forever, mm. it was like, it's Saturday, whatever I don't get done now, that goes to next week. Yeah. And uh, I appreciated that structure. Uh, it took me a few years to discover that, but it it, takes it's a while, been very helpful. Especially from uh, people with wild imaginations like ours. You know, it's, it's, we have to corral that. Even though you want that on the page, in your regular life, you have to be a regular working person, you know, and, and, and resting person, <laughs> person who rests. It's yeah. a lot of pot. Because <laughs> it just got illegal in uh, Nevada, and the dispensaries are so much fun, let me tell you. 
It's all old ladies telling you what the good pot is. <laughs> oh, this stuff's great. I watch monster movies when I eat drink, take this stuff. And I'm like, I don't know if that's a, an aid for cartoonists or not. I have a, well, a list me, of things I try to avoid, well, things well, like video games, you know, that, anything that could... Oh, that, that keeps you, yeah, that you get hooked on, you, yes. you're time wasters. Yeah. Absolutely. No, it's because like I said, after five o'clock, I'm done for the day, because I get it pretty early because my daughter take her to school, but um, I'm, I'm, my work, once it's that, that the clock hits five o'clock, I am done. No more comics, nothing. Like I said, I, I might have to squeeze in a couple of minutes, you know, a half hour or so to finish something, but normally I don't. I just stop. We have dinner, we hang out, you know, I hang out with my family, and uh, my daughter, you know, wanted to start smoking pot, so, but we said, okay, under our supervision, you know, and she can smoke it with us, but we, we I'm not, that's not saying that she's not going to do it with her friend, but we just, you have to play the role, you have to be the parent. No, 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 you can't do that. And she doesn't really, but what's great is, is it, that taboo is lifted, so she's not that into it. I mean, she'll do it a little bit, but not, you know. She's not like I was, you know, hiding from my mom, just getting right. hiding every day, you know. <laughs> yeah, I hear parents uh, talk about, you know, trying not to build energy around whatever the item is. You yeah, know, yeah. It, it could be any habit. Uh, um, I was going to, you know, I, I have some notes that I prepared for this, and uh, you've hit a couple of them. So uh, I was going to ask you about your daughter, because I, I've met your daughter. She makes comics, and so many people I know that make comics, their kids aren't even interested in comics. Yeah. So I wonder what the experience is like, you know, it must be very exciting, enjoyable, I assume, seeing your daughter do it, this. It is. It's not like uh, her main focus. I mean, she likes doing it, but it's not like, like Jaime and I grew up just rabidly drawing and wanting to do, make our little comic books and this and that. Where she's okay with it, but it was more that uh, since, you know, she was little and, you know, daddy's working on comics all the time. So, oh, daddy, I have to make my comic now. It was simple as that. You know, but she's she was wired for it because uh, my older brother Mario, he's got the four kids, and they're not interested at all, at all. They just, I mean, they liked it. They thought it was cool. But then again, he didn't make comics a lot. He was only did it once in a while. Uh, so um, anyway, so she just liked it. She goes, "Daddy, we're going to Comic Con, and I need a comic book." And I said, "Okay." You know, and uh, I just helped her do her first comic, and she sat with me, and and I we kept trying to emphasize, like, "Look, honey." Um, this is great that you have your comic at Comic Con, but I want you to appreciate this because not people can't get even get in Comic Con, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so this you, you're lucky to, to sit next to me at a table and people buy your comics, you know. And uh, she's but she appreciates it. She she likes doing it. Uh, she's getting less and less interested in, in pushing herself to do comics, but she still loves uh, going to a convention because you know she just she just loves the people and she just loves the, the whole atmosphere. And she loves conventions. She just loves it and. Uh, or like I said, my older brother and, and, and Jaime's daughter are just eh about it. It's weird. Yeah. It's interesting, the convention. Um, I, I've talked to Jaime and, and other cartoonists of your generation about the comic convention experience. Mm -hmm. uh, I started doing this in 2000, and SPX was my second show that I ever attended, which is very different than some of the traditional comic shows mm -hmm. that, that you guys oh, probably right. went through in the 80s and mm -hmm. early 90s. Uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how that has changed. You know, you've mentioned mainstream, and even mainstream, I think, is a weird classification in comics now. Yeah. Uh, because everything's an alternative or a niche or, you know, a subculture. Um, you know, and I wonder if there's just any reflections on your early experiences at shows and how this culture has changed. It, w it was always difficult for a small press comic to get noticed. You know, it, w it, w it always was. Luckily, Fanographics had already had a presence at Comic-Con. So they would, you know, we could always park our, you know, books there and, you know, do so. So, um, but it was a little more, uh, uh, it was a little easier to get it around. It wasn't like you can't get into Comic-Con. It wasn't a Hollywood. It wasn't any of that. And there were still old people making comics. That, that was the fun part. Old men were walking around, you know, with canes and pipes. And, but they always wore suits. <laughs> and this was so, so, so and so drew comics in the 40s. And, you know, they were around. There's hardly any of them now left. But, uh, yeah, I'm one of the old guys now. That's the, that's the weird uh, weird thing about it. Oh, veteran cartoonist Gilbert Hernandez. Like, what? When did that happen? I just got started. <laughs> you know? But um, it was different. It was fun. It was more of a lighthearted thing. You could actually skip a, a year because nothing was going on, you know? But now it's like, you know, it's such a business. It's like it's just best to be there doing this, sell your books, whatever, if you can. I mean, you don't really need to go to Comic-Con unless you're really into the experience. Uh, that could, because uh, co conventions like this didn't exist when we first started. And now you have this, and, and, and the cake, and Dink, and uh, other you know, uh, 
you know, ape, and just different things that are just like you can just avoid that stuff and, and just have because this has such a great attendance. I mean, every year it just gets better and better, and it's all for uh, you know, um, you know, uh, comics that people are just you know, basically their personalities on on comics. You know, it's in comics they're they're, they're not. Uh, you know, trying to sell the, the new Hulk comic or whatever, you know, and, and that's a real good thing. And, and the thing is, the, what, like you're saying, talking about the change in, with the mainstream, they had to deal with that, that when Love and Rockets and other comics started coming out and then Dan Klaus' stuff and Peter Baggs, and then pretty soon it was too many cartoonists to ignore, you know, at, at the time, and we weren't going away. Uh, and so they, uh, so DC and Marvel scrambled for having all their alternative lines, which failed miserably. The only one that uh, lasted for a while was Vertigo. Mm -hmm. But before that, there was Piranha Press, and Mar Marvel had epic lines. Right. They, but they failed. Nobody wanted to read them, you know, because they were mainstream guys trying to do alternative stories, and it just didn't, just didn't work. I don't know. Um, so, so they had to just, um, you know. Uh, 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 compete with uh, the smaller books, the better books, you know, that were independently published <laughs> by simply having more of their books in the, on the shelves. So they, that's when uh, they started doing the collections, X-Men collections and Fantastic Four collections, and making the books as thick as possible right. so they would push us off the shelves because retailers are going to say, this is going to sell better than this little, you know, little mini comic, this little, you know, black and white thing. And so there was a, a problem with business there, but we, we crushed them. You know, they're, uh, they're, they're hopeless. They're just, do, they're just floundering with, because the movies, they're just fodder for the movies now. You know, if you pick up uh, an X-Men comic right in the middle of it and you hadn't read one in 10 years, it's just mush. You don't even know what the hell's going on. It's only for the hardcore reader who kept reading it. And that's not good because you want the rest of the world to buy comics like they did back in the old days, you know, but it's not like that anymore. Did you have a, um, you know, like you mentioned Dan Klaus, uh, I feel like there's been a sense of antagonism between indie comics and mainstream comics uh, from artists maybe that were, you know, coexisting with, with those yeah. things in the 80s. I wonder if you felt any of that personally? Um, most of it's off the record, you know? I mean, the people, people talking shit, you know, but everybody does, I mean, we, you know. Um, yeah, there was there's a there's a there's a certain animosity toward uh, from the mainstream for the the indie artist because like I said we don't go away we have you know we get uh, actually we get a lot better press than they do you know because people are just more interested in the different subjects you know they're not all interested in the Hulk and and you know Thor and whatever they're interested in. Uh, uh, something a uh, graphic novel Dan Klaus did, or Chris Ware did, or, or Jim Woodring. You know, they're more. It's just that's just more interesting. That speaks to the world, whereas mainstream stuff speaks to the fan of mainstream comics. So that's yeah, I ironically, you yeah. know, ma mainstream is that small. Yeah, the, uh, comic book wise. But what happened? The horror. This always happens. Mainstream always wins. They were dying, and then the movies came out. Right. And then Iron Man came out, and then X Men came out, and then boom, it's all back. You know. <laughs> so, but. Uh, it's more about the movies than the comics. You know, they're barely getting those comics that scrape. I always think that, uh, you know, like if you if you look at numbers of the books that are sold and mm -hmm. a lot of that information is available and you start to do the math on page rates and things oh, yeah. and you realize like they're licensing companies. Yeah. You know, their much. their profitability is selling socks mm -hmm. with Spider-Man on it and, you know, mm -hmm. Slurpee cups or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and video games, you know, selling everything, I some, suppose. With sometimes that. Time Warner, they consider just dropping DC because it's just lose, losing money all the time. But they have to convince them, like, no, without this, you can't make your movies, and you can't buy the, the toys. They go, right. oh, that's the profit. You know, the toys, the, you know. So anyway, back to, yeah, there's, an, there's, a, there's a, the indie uh, artist who's been working forever, like me and Klaus and, you know, uh, Bag and stuff. We, we, we get frustrated that it's really difficult to make a living doing it. it we really, uh, it, it's hard, and, and, and we, want, we do it because we want to. But it's difficult for anybody in uh, making comics to, to make a, a living. Whereas, so that's, that's where the, uh, you know, the little, the little anime, oh, they get paid at DC, they get a page rate and stuff. But at the same time, over at DC, they're not creating their own stuff. Right, I'm sure they're looking and at, they're at you and thinking, at, oh, you're yeah. creatively free to do whatever you want. Yeah. And I've heard guys that were big stars at DC as artists. Well, they, they can only be stars for five years and then they get replaced. But they would just complain, like, all right, they just they can't stand Chris Ware or, or, or <laughs> Dan Klaus and this and that. And this is stuff I hear off the record, you know. Really? Yeah, they're just like, oh, I can't stand that shit. That shit has nothing to do with comics and stuff. And I'm thinking, like, you're fucking doing hand me downs. Somebody else created Thor, and he was a lot better than you, you know. <laughs> 
uh, that kind of stuff, you know. And uh, but I, you know, I just try to be cool because I try to be happy, pleasant. But um, it, there is that there, there is that friction, but it's un, unspoken. It's not written about. Uh, uh, somebody just interviewed Howard Chaykin, who used to be a star in the '70s and in the '80s, and started and his popularity started to wane. And he just the other day, he said he interviewed him, and he was just frustrated that you know why are the indie guys getting all this attention? And I go, it's been 35 years since the Rockets, and they're still still like, God damn it, you know, yeah. how come it's not me? How come it's like, I understand that it, when it's hard to, uh, you know, make a living, you know, on either side, you know. So you just get frustration all the time. Okay, that's the sad part. Making comics is happy and good. Well, I, <laughs> you know, I, I part of the reason I asked about that relationship between alternative and mainstream comics is because you you have done work in that editorial system. Um, you know, when I started making comics, you guys were my my ideal. Um, you know, and I was making mini comics and auto bio comics and things that would be considered alternative mm -hmm. comics. But in my head, uh, because I was self-taught, I had a list of things I wanted to do and that included working with um, you know, editors and kind of going through that system to see mm -hmm. what that experience is like and hopefully learn a lot. Yeah. Um, and so we both, uh, I, I think one of the first editors that you worked with was Shelley Bond yeah. at DC Comics, at Vertigo Comics, who was also the first editor that I worked with in that system. And I, I wondered, um, you know, what your experience was like. I assume it was good because you've done several projects, and I believe you're doing a project with her now. I don't know if you want to talk, yeah. if that's something to talk about, or uh, yeah, briefly. Um, I, it's, IDW is a, mostly a reprint uh, a company that reprints very good uh, news, old newspaper strips and stuff, and they 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 jumped into the new comics forum, and um, they have a, an imprint called Black Crown, which they're going to print, you know, uh, have sort of mainstreamy type adventure comics, you know, just to try the waters. And uh, Shelley left DC, where she was, where she was the editor at uh, uh, Vertigo. Uh, so she was like the indie person to go to <laughs> at, at DC. And she was great, because she, 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 she just loves stuff. But uh, the experience with Shelley is she's the type of person that just, this is a personality thing, that she says, okay, you just create your comic, you, you know, you, we, we make sure it's worth printing, and da, da, da. And, I, I, I keep, I, I'll keep my hands away from it. She's on the phone every other day, you know, with her fingers in it. She just gets so into it. And I think that's what, what her drive is. Because now she's oh, with IDW and that she's editing me in a new book. And it's, it's like, you know, and I've got, I got realized, wow, this has been like 25 years, 20 years working with her because she just has that kind of, you know, uh, um, energy. Uh, you know, just she just thinks every new project is the best thing she's ever done. You know, which is great, which is great, you know. That's what you need in a... Uh, a company that you know actually pays. Yeah, yeah. That 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 energy is something that I responded to, mm -hmm. and then as I worked with other editors after her, uh, oh. not everyone. That's not a standard process no, no, for it's editors. Not. It's, just, it's just your personality. It's a, yeah. um, but I wonder, you know, is that process different? Does it force you to show more planning or, or change your process in order to communicate with an editor? You know, I assume whenever you're doing your own work. A lot of that can be in your head. It can be notes that only you understand. Yeah. But when you're working with, you know, collaboratively, how does that change or affect your it, process? It, it was difficult at first because you have to, you have to let, basically tell them what you're doing. And we uh, indie folks just don't know what we're doing half the time. But it gets there. It will get there. But it, but these people are, are, you know, have so much, you know, money involved in, in that stuff, is that they just need to know. You know, I need a paragraph of exactly what this is about. I want to know what happens and what happens at the end. I go, nobody knows what happens at the end, you know? But that's how they just work it. That's how they do it. And I understand because they're putting so much, because they put a lot of money in production and promotion. So there's a lot of money involved with those folks. So, but it, what it does for an artist like me, though, but it, it, I, the, the discipline has to come up. I've got to know what I'm doing. I've got to get uh, the work out when I can uh, on a schedule, if I, if I can. Uh, so it's 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 it was rough at first because I, I every time I would do those books I go I don't want to do this I can't do this but I would you know press on, um, but it, it's a, it's basically a learning experience even when it's a book I don't want to be doing and I can't say which books they are because <laughs> no I, I don't want to get in trouble you know I still need to work you know so uh, but there are books I just didn't I just was so like tired of doing because I just you know okay there you go and I would do it and I did my best but I, I wasn't that into it and. It just, um, but it taught me. So as soon as I would do the stuff I didn't want to do their way, I would go back to Love and Rockets, 
and it was just 16 pages for me, you know, and the, the magazine, sorry, and it was easy. Because I'd already gone through the, the headache of, because when I first started doing comics, the headache and, and the fun part were all at the same time. Now the headache is over with the, the, the work for hire stuff, and the other, uh, the love and rock stuff, the personal stuff has gotten actually easier. I'm more confident because, you know, I'm more confident in my drawing, I'm more confident in telling the story of what I'm putting in, what I'm put, not putting in. Um, it's just the downside is that the uh, the work for hire stuff takes so much time and energy that the other stuff, the good stuff that I want to do, uh, it takes a little longer because it's you know I'm trading back and forth. I gotta find something happy to say. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> something happy. All right. <laughs> maybe maybe I can uh, shift the focus a little bit to uh, to the actual art making and drawing. Um, you know I. I I listened to some interviews with you leading up to this to, to prepare, and um, I heard you talking about sh kind of shifting from graphic novels back to comic book format, you know, because of the scale of the graphic novels. And I heard you actually refer to the size of some of the bigger books, um, you know, like I, I assume Bumperhead and, and Lulu's Day, some of the physically larger books versus drawing smaller. Um, I think it's interesting to shift up format like that, and I think it's something that a lot of artists don't do. You know, they tend to Draw the same size. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I wonder, uh, it, you know, is that a creative impulse? Is it something publishers do? It's, do you like it's, that? It's, it's more of a, a, a gut feeling that I, um, okay, I did, you know, because when I worked with uh, DC and a couple of times Marvel and Dark Horse, they would send me paper. And it's, it's large, right? And and I could get away with drawing on that, that large size because I normally draw smaller, but I could get away with it because I wasn't uh, lettering it. See, that, that's a whole different animal, you know, for, for me. Um, so I would draw large, but I noticed I would tire more, just because I'm, I'm, I'm erasing larger spaces, inking larger black, inking larger, and I just got tired of it, and I just said, look, can I do this book you know, with a smaller size paper, and this time? And they said, okay, just, yeah, just don't tell the boss, I was like, okay. So I did, I did a book that was a little smaller, and it was, it was better. It was just more suited, because it was more of a love and rocket size. It's a little bit smaller than the, the, the large mainstream stuff. So now um, I just I just draw as small as I can, only because uh, I just got comfortable with drawing smaller. <laughs> it just did, I don't know, it just evolved that way. And so now I draw relatively small, and uh, even though I miss the, the the spread of a large page, you know, I can just really you know stretch it out. Uh, I'm I'm more kind of confident and more comfortable with a smaller size uh, page that I'm trying on. But it took it took a while to just realize I'm, I'm tired, you know. Like one time I was erasing an issue and I threw my shoulder up, you know. <laughs> like, why, why is my arm all stiff? Why am I tired after I get, It's literally just fit, fixing and finishing up the pages to send, you know. And and they're huge, so I get my scanners are small, so like you know I'd have to send mail it in. So uh, I just decided even recently I go. If people say, if you can buy a bigger scanner, and I said, I got a scanner, I'm just going to dress small enough for it to fit. Yeah. <laughs> so, that, that's interesting. That's the, you know, kind of the influence behind what seems like a creative yeah, decision. Yeah, because a lot of it's practical considerations. Yeah, yeah, because for me, practical considerations and the creative effort are hand in hand. For me, it's, it's, I, I'm not afraid of like, well, I think outside the box, and it's going to hurt me if I draw a different, because their way, the man's way. No, the man's way can work. You can make it work. It's got all about your creativity and how it works. Do you see a difference in your art, working big or small? I feel like your art's very consistent uh, you know, from my perspective, but is it something you're conscious of? Well, if I went back to drawing large, uh, my, my art would be wonky. So I'm not used to drawing the larger. Because, okay, something simple like drawing a face, it, it takes a while because you have to set the eyes properly, you have to put the nose, and then they have to look exactly the same in, in every panel at different angles. And so sometimes, I'll find myself when I, when I was working larger that I wouldn't do close-ups because they're difficult, uh, you know, uh, drawing large like that. Now, but everybody uses cheats with their Photoshop and all stuff and changes the stuff. I just draw like a caveman, you know. I just I erase it and I mess up. I put white on. I did. I just draw on the paper. That's it. So it's difficult for me to draw large images that are supposed to be representational on on large paper. Now, uh, with a smaller size, I, I have less of a challenge doing that, you know, and, and I can scale faces and, and sizes of people uh, a lot. Not necessarily quicker just out of convenience, but just quicker uh, as far as confidence. Is because you need, besides your brain, what's good about working a lot, like I do, is you get muscle memory. 
and, and you need that if you want to produce a lot of comics. Um, especially because I don't draw in the, in the sort of simplistic uh, peanuts, uh, ziggy way that a lot of people do now. That's fine, but I still draw like a, a person from the 1950s, you know, <laughs> it uh, has to put all this stuff in it. And so uh, that works better for me small. Although in Las Vegas, here's, I use technical pens for like straight lines and lettering and stuff, and they dry up because just the, 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 the atmosphere, the, the, the climate in Vegas, everything, um, everything liquid just dries up really quickly. And uh, I'll, I'll fill in a pen, you know, the ink, and uh, it has a stainless steel tip and a little needle, and I can do these hard lines. and Because I've tried markers with too soft, uh, no matter what. But anyway, I try to use that, and then literally the next day, I'm going, that's good, scratch. And I'm looking, and it's dried up overnight, you know. So I have to uh, hunt down the best, you know, uh, felt markers that are hard and edge and stuff down over there. But this is recent, and I really think uh, it's uh, materials are just cheaper now. They keep making cheap materials cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Like uh, Black India ink, uh, I and I took us forever to find a good place that sold it because it was all watered down and gray and blotchy, and you, you or else you'd get you know, your pen and you'd make a line and just go like a feather. <laughs> you know, look, I feel like we could spend the rest of the half hour talking about this. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, the, 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 the stuff doesn't isn't that interesting, but it does affect how you make your art. Absolutely, how you yeah. get it. How the art gets to you guys, you know. It yeah. does. I, I didn't mean to cut that off. I was no, ready no, no, to no, fall in. I, I bought. Um, I, I've had the same thing. Searching for the kind of ink that you want. Um, I was ordering ink by like the pint from a vendor in Tampa Bay that I had to call. Like they didn't really have a website, or they didn't have like a, an online ordering system. Um, so these are the lengths that, that you know cartoonists go to find these, I guess, antiquated tools in a lot of ways. Um, but you find the tools that perform, and I think you're right about a lot of the quality going down. You yeah, know, I think a lot of it is just cheaper. The cut corner, like paper is cheaper. Um, paper is very inconsistent. I find. Oh, uh, I found when we, we met Charles Burns many years ago. Uh, he has the most beautiful plan ever. You know, it's just it looks like an Android you know, or a computer. Did. And we asked him, so how do you how do you do that? He goes, oh, I go through. Uh, I have to buy about 15 brushes to get the right one. Because they they because brushes are all because it's, it's it's you know it's it's, uh, it's hair. It's nothing's perfect. It's it's like he'll do the line goes. Oops, that's not good. I'll put it aside and then just use that. Use it for inking wax in or whatever. And then he'll get the other one and he'll try the line. Nope. And he said he, he went one time. He went through 15. Took a wood from the right line. You know. And that's a lot of money. His wings are made for moving brushes. You know. But now he says he's worked it out. Like he doesn't care anymore. <laughs> I'll just use what I got. And if it works, it works. And you, you don't see the difference. It no, of course not. He that's was just a perfectionist. He was just right. crazy. I, I was going to ask about that, like how much, you know, to what degree do you consider audience, you know, some of my work has, has been described as obsessive, and I tend to profile different uh, occupations, and cartoonists definitely tend towards the obsessive, mm -hmm. uh, at least the cartoonists that I know, and, you know, speaking of myself personally, mm -hmm. but I find myself at times getting so obsessive that I need to pull back because I realize it's it's not yielding results for anyone. You're right. You know, it's taking all this time to do something that nobody's going to see. Is that mm -hmm. is that something you're conscious of whenever you're working, like thinking about an audience? Maybe not just in this mm -hmm. on the technical side, but you know, in all all aspects of your storytelling. When when you're writing, do you have a reader? Is it? You... Yeah, I, I I basically put myself as the, as the phantom audience. You know, I I'm like, okay, what do I want to see? You know, well. To quote, to, to, to quote uh, or paraphrase the great uh, cartoonist of Wally Wood, there was an old comic strip. Some of you might have heard of this. There was an old comic strip called Nancy, and it was basically really primitive, real simple. And people made fun of it because of that. But at the same time, people were obsessed about it. And so uh, the great cartoonist Wally Wood, he says, but they go, what do you think? Because he was a very obsessive artist, a technical artist, and he was very good. But he, they asked, what do you think of things like Nancy? And it's opposite. He goes, well, I'll tell you, there's something about Nancy. He goes, he goes. by the time you look at the newspaper and you don't want to read Nancy, you've already read it. <laughs> so I always have that in mind that immediacy is better than impressing people with detail. You know, just reading it, like, uh, it didn't hurt Charles Schultz, you know, uh, making the simplest looking comic uh, uh, you know, the, he, I mean, but, you know, he put so much humanity and character into it, you know, even with his little simple lines. You look at something like Ziggy and it's, there's nothing there, you know. 
that you know they're using the same amount of lines and this and that. Uh, the, the, the cartoonist. Um, but anyway, so when I'm reading, when I look at my comics, I go, what do I want to read? Do I go I want to go to this really heavy, dense stuff that there's a few fans that like it, or do I want them to read it, <laughs> to enjoy it, be a pleasant experience? Because I went through a real rough patch of over rendering everything and making panels smaller and smaller, like uh, Poison River and Love and Rockets X. And, even Birdland. There was that period where I just was just I just lost my control over what was you know good for the comic or what I wanted against what information I want to put in it. So I decided, well, I'm not, I'm just you know throw caution to the wind. I'll just do it obsessively. And now I can't even look at that stuff. I just would rather read the stuff that's real simple. <laughs> oh, you open the book up. There's this person just walking down the street. There's a tree, and you know, just uh, and, and the immediacy uh, works for me better. Yeah, I personally, uh, that that's a value in work that I read and work that I try to create. Mm -hmm. uh, that readability, yeah. um, and I don't know exactly where that stems from. You know, obviously everyone has different taste. Uh, I think of like when I was trying to figure out how to make comics, I would write to Marvel. They would have a submission guide. And it was just like a piece of paper that would tell you what they were looking for. And one of the things they said was, you should be able to read what's going on without reading the words. Yeah, yeah. And so like that was one of my first lessons in trying to understand how to make comics. And it's something that I continue to value is that ability to sort of read smoothly. Yeah, but yeah. as you say, you know, there are a lot of popular, successful comics that are different. Mm -hmm. Did something happen to make you aware that, that you were going in that direction and it wasn't a direction you were happy with? Did you get feedback from someone you, you know, you, you value their opinion or? No, it was more like just look, you know, finishing the book and getting it back, you know, from the printer, uh, from Gary, uh, from the fanographics for the printer and looking at it going, I didn't want to look at it. You know, I was burned out from doing it, and then I tried to read it, and I go, this is just, what, what was I thinking? You know? Right. It was funny. Uh, yeah, I just decided it's just better. And, and my brother's his style has always been clean and smooth, and it was always easier to read. And I said, why don't I just do that? <laughs> you know, what am I doing with this dense stuff? I, I, I put that behind me, basically. And, yeah. But I'm still trying to make the, the material as focused and, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, you know have, have, have weight instead of just lightly saying, hi, bye. You know, <laughs> you know, even though that works for some stories, uh, I just I just thought, well, if you're gonna have simple stories, you better keep the, the, the weight of the, the situation in, in it. So you've done a variety of stories in terms of genre, from, you know, kind of fun, lighter stories to uh, heavier things, dark things. Um, does that affect your mood when you're working on them, or is it reflective of, of sort of where you're at when you're coming up with these concepts? I'm not really conscious of it while I'm doing it. You know, people will point it out at a convention or something. Like, man, what were you going through with this comic? Go, what were you thinking? What were you wrong? I go, no, I was just, nothing. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't, like when I started doing Blubber, my recent uh, uh, anti-do-gooder comic, um, <laughs> it was just basically, I just wanted to harken back to the old undergrounds that were just gross and creepy, but funny, but funny. Most important thing was it had to be funny. Um, and I was looking at old uh, S. Clay Wilson stories. He's an old underground cartoonist that probably drew the rudest comics, but not without uh, style and, and you know effort and uh, uh, you know uh, creativity. Um, but rude and, and horrible. But uh, and I remember back when I was a teenager, nobody liked it. They they, they like Crumb. They like Crumb. They liked uh, Gilbert Shelton because he did dope hippie comics. But this S. Clay Wilson guy was Satan. You know. Now I look at it and I go, this is just funny, <laughs> you know, this is really, I mean, because things like humor has changed, like uh, last, you know, 10 years ago, it was, uh, 15 years ago, it was Jackass, you know, the, the, those, they got really popular, and instead of the world sinking into the sea, you know, the it, people, it got more popular, until it burned out, you know, right. it burned out. Uh, so I thought, oh, that's kind of funny, uh, there's no comics like that really anymore. Anyway, and I have too much energy, so I figured I'm doing Lone Rockets, I'm doing, I'm trying to finish a graphic novel that it, I've owed graphics for three years, and uh, and I just thought, you know, I just I just antsy, you know, I just want I just want to draw goofy, weird monsters and stuff. And what's gonna bother people the most? They're having sex, because sex still bothers people, no matter what kind it is. Nice sex, mean sex, it, people still feel uncomfortable about it. So, do a comic about it. <laughs> I'm, I'm so surprised to hear that that answer. I think of uh, a lot of the comics I do as very much escapist 
yeah, yeah. lighter fare. And part of the reason is because I feel like I spend so much time with them in my head, mm -hmm. and I would rather have that in my head than something <laughs> of a heavier nature. So um, that, that's that's interesting to me that you're able to that it doesn't affect you more. Yeah, I, I mean I'm not aware of it. My wife and daughter might see it. I don't see it. I just see um, this is the next comic I'm doing, and this is the next one I'm going to do. I, I, but like I said, I get uh, people act, actually ask me, you know, like well, what, what were you going through during that? Because I don't really plan that way. I plan as like okay, this is what the story is, but not what's the meaning of it. You know, I mean that does come eventually, but when I do a story, it's like. Well, I haven't drawn this image yet, or it'd be good to open up the book and there'd be a large image, or you open up the book and there's tiny people in it. You know, just because to break up the the, the seeing, you know, what you're looking at. And, right. And you, you know, uh, I, I pull out a, our crumb collection, and that's what he did. You know, he was like, okay, I've already drawn stories that look, you know, similar, so I'll draw one that looks different or different kinds of characters with the way they look, just to break things up. You know. So we're getting kind of near, I guess, about 15 minutes left, um, and I do want to open this up to questions, but uh, I'm curious about what you're reading. Um, you know, do you read a lot of contemporary comics? Do you read a lot of comics? Um, I, you know what, I hate to say I don't, because I'm just always busy making comics, and uh, I've heard this from musicians. They go, I don't listen to music. <laughs> yes. I make music all day long. I'm not going to go listen to anything, you know? <laughs> Um, and sometimes, literally, a musician, because I, I know a couple of you know people in, in, in making music, and they just say, "Yeah, I ha I'll, sometimes if I'm driving in the car, I'll listen to my own music to hear the mistakes." But people think it's ego, like, "Oh, your ego is big. You listen to all." No, I'm listening to what I don't like about it. I go, "Oh, you know." And it's sim it's similar that um, I re reread my comics all the time just to see what I don't like. Really, I'm not reading it like. <laughs> Good old me. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> no, it's more like, God damn it, you know, I got to get this right next time, or I got to fix this, or oh, I screwed up this plot point, or you know. So I'm always rereading my stuff, and I, I don't like it. I, I, the further back I go, the more I don't like it. But sometimes I'm using a character from that far right. back, and so anyway. So uh, what was the question? <laughs> I, I was I was just uh, you know curious about your reading habits yeah, and if they're. No, I, I just don't get a chance. I get to grab stuff here. And then, uh, but I go into the uh, comic store, you know, once in a while with my daughter, and it's like water, water everywhere. You know, I just can't. There's just so much stuff I can't, you know. And I'm not interested in, in, in mainstream stuff. And I work with Fanographics and IDW, and the, and all the book the books they put out are the ones I usually buy. But I get them for free now, so I really can't buy anything. So I don't really. But uh, as far as seeing new stuff, it's usually when somebody uh, show you got to see this or check this out or whatever. I, I don't get to see a lot of stuff. Just. I'm always working, I'm right. seven days a week. Seven days? Yeah. Oh, when, like I said, when I'm on a, uh, putting right. a book that needs to get out, uh, I'll do that. But normally I like to do the five days. Um, and the last thing that, I, that I'll ask you about before we open this up is uh, teaching comics. Um, you know, it seems like whenever I went to school, there were very few comics programs, which is probably good, you know. <laughs> I'm sure that's what I would have studied and, and missed out on something else. but. Um, I'm curious if you've done that, if, if it's something that you're interested in, you know, with your daughter making comics. I, I don't know if this is something that I assume schools approach you to come and speak yeah, or do well, workshops while, at least. Speak. But it's usually the Latino angle. You know, it's usually that, you know, it's a university that just want, wants to have a Latino artist to talk. You know, that, and that's fine. I'll take what I can get, you know. Um, I, I don't mind that stuff. Uh, but... Um, uh, no, not really. And, and, and if I did that, it would take a lot of time because it, comics are full-time work, you know. And I prefer to do comics over anything if I can help it, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, if I got a, an offer I couldn't refuse, yeah, I would. Maybe a Gilbert Hernandez book on how to make comics would be. Yeah, I'm doing a workshop today at three o'clock that uh, it's, it's set up. And basically, I because I, I can't teach you how to be yourself. I can't. But what I can do is give you tips and shortcuts so you don't have to uh, learn the hard way like I did. <laughs> you know, uh, things like uh, basically, uh, I, I believe in starting uh, a, sto a scene in a story at the top of the page, and it ends at either the same page or the next page, however long your scene is, because that way you can mix and match. If you mess up with uh, uh, material that should have been spoken, but but you can't fit it in. You can always add a page be before. Whereas I used to have a scene starting in the middle, or I starting at the end of the page, and it didn't work. So I'd literally have to cut it up and tape tape it together. You know, I mean, people do it on computer. I don't know how to do that. But I used, in the old days, it, you, my a lot of my old art has like big 
hung some masking tape on the back, you know, where I just cut up the pages. Editing is such a strange beast in comics. Yeah. Uh, for that reason, it's it's interesting that your you know work around is the page mm-hmm. is being like the unit that you can manipulate. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's that's something I struggle with too. Uh, one of your stories that I always loved, and I can't remember which issue of Love and Rockets it's in, so this is probably going to be hard for me to communicate. Mm-hmm. But it, it featured these time jumps in the middle of pages where several months would pass between oh, okay. panels, and I read it in a free comic book day issue. And when I first read it, I thought. Is this like an excerpt, almost like a trailer from a graphic novel? Mm-hmm. But it was the complete story, and it just stuck with me. I've reread it many times because of how it jumps from panel to panel in a way that really I don't see done. Uh, I can't think of other examples um, a lot, a lot outside of, those, of you. A lot of those times, uh, those, a lot of those things are embarrassing to me now because I didn't let the reader know exactly what was going on. It was just too vague. I, I would change the look of a character. Like I could have, you know, say a woman. She has long hair in the story, and then I would do a flashback and the character would have short hair. Well, I found out the hard way that a lot of readers didn't notice <laughs> that it was a flashback. Sure. So, I, so now I'm being a lot more clear with that. I think I was just being too arty. I think uh, I just want the reader, like I said, I don't want the reader to get confused or get lost or lose interest because it's hard to follow. Yeah. That, that's really important for me, to, for the reader now, to just you know, read it and get it. Yeah. I always think about that. Anything that stops the reading mm-hmm. in a way is a problem. Even if it's that it's a great drawing and yeah, it yeah. stops them to look at the drawing or to you know, step out of the story uh, can be a problem, even if it's something that looks nice. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, well, we have some, some time. If anyone has any questions. Yes? Yes, sir. I confess, I really love the Poison River arc on Love and Rockets. Mm-hmm. And I'm Thank you. Mm-hmm. Where do you think those moments are that it is important to sort of give the reader something that's a little more challenging that stops them in their path and controls the pace of them reading that page? Uh, my, you know what? I think that's past in my past now. I think Poison River really burned <laughs> burn that out. I don't think heavy anymore. I mean, if it comes out, it comes out. But I don't really think about, uh, uh, you know, making it really dense and really uh, heavy uh, subject matter uh, these days. Uh, I hope I don't turn into one of those artists that no longer can do a dark story or no longer, because that happens. You know how, how many you know filmmakers like you know in the 70s were just mavericks and knocking butts. They make movies now and they're just generic, you know, because you do get older and you do don't want to be in that dark place anymore, you know. So I got to be careful with that, you know. I have to be careful that if if I'm going to replace the heavy density with something else, it better have equal weight. Because if it doesn't, it's just fluff, and there's no. But I'm good with fluff. I mean, yes, if it pays. You know. um, any other questions? Would you mind uh, stepping to the microphone to? It's way the f back. <laughs> Thank you. Um. No. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Are you sure about the microphone? <laughs> Maybe the microphone isn't that important. Yeah, yeah. you can shout loud enough. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Hello. Hi, um, I'm a student here on a class trip, actually, and I have a question. Like, well, obviously, I have a question. Yeah. Have you ever had to fight against perfectionism? Have you ever looked at something over and over again and just like, it's not good enough, it's never going to be good enough? And if you have fought about it, fought with it, how did you overcome it? Well, for me, it's not. I'm, I'm not a perfectionist. Um, because I'm just not that kind of artist. I just don't draw in that perfect way. Uh, but what happens is I'll just, I will see a drawing that just doesn't work. You know, I look at the overall page, I look at the panel, and, and, and it's the face does not work, the, the position of the, the character doesn't, it just doesn't work. And um, sometimes I'll just uh, use a little bit of white out and change the arm, I'll change the ear, I'll change the eye, just things like that, and it just gets worse. You know, you, you push yourself to make it better, and it gets worse and worse and worse. So I just figure, um, <laughs> I've done this before, and I shouldn't be giving this stuff away. <laughs> so what I'll do is I'll just get some uh, artist tape and just tape right over it and put a tree there instead of the person. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious, because that's the only way. And luckily, I'll step back from it and I go, that was a better decision. So basically, your brain is screwing you up making a bad drawing so you won't do that drawing. That's what I believe. That's what I believe. I believe there's a lot of stuff in the back of our head that's, that's running things that we don't know. 
and a lot of times it's correct and what you're looking at isn't. You know, like, well, I should draw this person. I should keep really drawing this person. And your, your subconscious or unconscious, it will just be saying, no, just get rid of it. it. It's not working because it's not good. So I trust that those times because I don't have time to reflect that long on one panel that looks awful. But, uh, and then sometimes you're just tired and you just have to let that bad panel go. The good thing is the reader doesn't know if that's a bad panel, unless they tell you. But otherwise it's like, oh, that's what it's supposed to look like. But we're in our heads like, this is bad, this is, I want this to be. So I guess that goes a little bit to perfectionism, but uh, I, don't, I don't do it to make it perfect. I just make it to make it right for the rest of the story is what it is. Um, I would say for, for me, because uh, that is something I struggle with, probably every cartoonist struggles with, it's part of that profile I've, I've made in my mind. <laughs> um, deadlines are like the, the key for me. You know, if I know the thing is due, you know, whenever that is, you can only do so much, so that's really helpful. Um, yeah. If I were completely doing this without deadlines, I would probably never finish anything. Mm -hmm. So, and deadlines can come from all, you know, whenever I was self-publishing and making mini comics, a deadline might be SPX. Mm -hmm. You know, I wanna have my, my comic ready for it. So, you know, the deadlines can come from a lot of places. You know, as a student, I'm sure you have assignments that are due at certain times. Um, I find that useful, and, and as Gilbert says, you know, like the stuff that you're so conscious of, a lot of times it might be a poorly drawn background detail mm -hmm. that just no one notices, whether you nail that yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. insignificant detail or not. Um, and that can, be, uh, that can be good and bad. You know, sometimes you get stuck thinking about the ramifications of that. But uh, yeah, I would say deadlines are probably the biggest thing for me for, you can only change so much, you know? Here's a, fun, this is a quick funny thing. I did a, a book called, uh, which was, oh, it was called Lover Boys, and I did it, it was a, a short graphic novel for uh, Dark Horse. And my editor would get the pages and go, there's these weird things on the, on the, in the, some of the panels that we can't figure out what they are. I go, what, what, what? So I'd look at my copies, I go, what are you talking about? It's got a weird thing with an A, and it's got a weird droop, and it looks like a weird, I'm like, oh, that's a street light. And it's just showing that uh, there's a street in the distance. But she just, it, it just, for her, it made her skin crawl. She just goes, oh, you know what, could, could you take them off? I go, it's a street light. She goes, but I'm not seeing that. I see this A, and it's creeping me out. So I go, let me, let me, wait, let me look outside the street. And I looked out, I looked out the street, and I go, she's right. That street lights don't look like that. I, for some reason, I saw some street lights that looked like that, and they stuck in my head. Some, somehow, you know. Right. And Sure enough, I go, that doesn't look like a street light. So uh, I turned them into a telephone pole, and she was uh, fine with that. But it was weird, it creeped her out. It was a detail, so it was the opposite. I didn't notice something was not working. But, she, well, she was really neurotic, and she would, things like that were like, <laughs> I'm freaking out, this, this street light's creeping me out. And I'm like, okay, we'll take it out. <laughs> you know? It's funny. Have you had, um, you know, it seems like, like especially your own work, the, the Love and Rockets, the more personal stuff, you seem to be your own editor on, on this work. Have you had uh, issues with confidence, you know, by relying on yourself where you're like, I, I just, I don't know if this is working. Has that been an I mean, issue that you- Mostly in the early days, but, but yeah, it's still, it's more like, you know what, this, is, this probably sucks, but I gotta get it out. I, I've convinced myself that getting it out is more important than uh, self-doubt, really. I mean, self-doubt can work, you know, it could help you, but it's, sometimes it takes too long. You right. Know, if you're neurotic like me, it might just, it'll just, keep you from finishing. You know? Yeah, I don't know how much it helps. <laughs> you yeah, know, you said so it might I, I, help. It's prob it might help once in a while, but if it's quick, <laughs> if it's a passing thing. You know? All right, uh, maybe time for one more question? Mm -hmm. um, you, you were very close to the hardcore scene and punk scene back in the 80s. Mm -hmm. What is this that you listen to now? Do you oh. find some kind of rebellious sound in your head that is actually influencing your art? I, I don't think so. I don't really, um, I'm 60, so I don't follow what's going on. I need to ask, this is funny, because oh, I've been listening to music since I was a kid, like seven years old, and, and, and I grew up in the 60s, so you just put on the radio and it was good. You know, it wasn't like, you know, why is there a good song? No, it was good. It was good music. And so I grew up, and then the, and as a teenager in the 70s, I grew up listening to hard rock music, and then later punk. So I basically, most of my life, I listened to hard rock music. Now, I have to ask, in the last five years, I haven't heard any hard rock, you know? I mean, I'm talking about good bands, like bands like everybody goes, oh yeah, they're great, oh yeah, they're great. They're always from 15 or 20 years ago. You know, goes, oh, the Black Keys are great. They're from 20 years ago, they started 20 years ago. Yeah. So, uh, oh, this person's great. Yeah, well, now they're from the 90s, you know? Uh, so I don't know, is there anybody I should know about now? What are they called? Listen to Sheermag. Sheermag, okay. 
Right. See, and, uh, and you youngsters with these fancy names. What is this, strawberry alarm clock? What are you talking about? <laughs> Early pink elevator. You know, it's a... Uh, no, anyway. Uh, yeah, okay, no, I was just wondering because I, I you know, I... My radio's limited. We live in Las Vegas, so there's limited. And I watch pop videos, but it's, it's, it's creepy. Pop videos are creepy because it's all about the looks of people. It's all pretty boys or pretty girls. And the funny thing is that what I always hear about, you know, like, these women are great, you know, uh, strides and women. And they're the, 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 the most, you know, like, just ridiculously sexy, <laughs> you know. Uh, some some gal might look like a 12 year old girl, and she's just you know in their, in their underwear and stuff. And I just think it's really funny. <laughs> I'm like, I'm, we're supposed to be looking at this like you know, this is serious. It, is, it is funny who who is the audience because often it's younger uh, yeah, girls that are into this. But it would be something as a parent you probably wouldn't want. Yeah, to I think. But it's I think all uh, the, over the, the, the younger girls just see a Barbie doll, and they get, they, they they get more. It's more about fashion and fun, and, and the girls expressing themselves. Where dirty old men like me just says, Oh my God, I gotta go <laughs> what are she doing? You know. So, it's just funny, but it's all about the, the, the stuff they put on the air now because uh, they're, they're always on the high channels on cable because you can't find them in, like we used to. And it's just uh, it's all about pretty people and pretty music, and it's weird. All right. Well, uh, they're giving us the go-home cue. So um, thank you all for coming out. Uh, you can find Gilbert throughout the weekend at the Fanographics table. Um, you're doing a, 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 a workshop at 3 o'clock? Yeah, 3 o'clock. So look for him there. Yeah, I'm going to be signing at the Fan Graphics from 2 to 3 and then the workshop at 3. So, All right. Well, thank you all very much. <laughs> and thank you.